So this is the last webinar for the PCR series for at least this fall. It seems to be uh, very popular. So I hope you have not only ideas about um, pedagogy that we wanna talk about in the breakout sessions, but also what else you would like, maybe next spring or more likely summer or the following fall. Because our next series is going to be all on the ATE um, projects. So we'll be listening to those and then also the five by five that um, Dr. Hewlett will be hosting. So one thing is in your breakout sessions, besides talking about how to teach PCR, what's hard about teaching PCR, and I also want you to think about what else you would like the center to do. I personally would like a face-to-face -face workshop and maybe more case development of case studies around the different PCR techniques. Because I felt like after I went through all these um, webinars, I really know nothing <laughs> about PCR and all the possibilities that PCR can be used for. And I need more hands-on education or training to be able to implement good education concerning PCR. So be thinking about that. And thank you, thank you for attending. And I look forward to hearing all of your input. Okay, Purnima. All right. Um... So uh, we, uh, as you, you all have received uh, uh, emails from uh, Cassandra earlier, and uh, thank you all for picking the topics that you were interested in. So uh, as you requested, we have uh, put you in breakout rooms um, for the topics that you have selected. And um, if there are certain breakout rooms that you would like to go, I, you should be able to leave the meeting, come back to the main room and uh, pick the, the, the meeting of your room, um, of your choice. So um, at this time, um, we are going to have uh, breakout rooms open at 3.15, um, or we could do it uh, right away. Um, I request Cassandra to go ahead and put the Google Drive for the moderators to have access to. Um, we have four breakout rooms. Um, and the moderators, I request again, um, we've already talked to them, but if you can please record the meeting at the sessions uh, and then share with the group afterwards. And then please uh, use the Google Drive uh, to uh, populate the conversation. And, and then um, at about 3.50, we'll, we'll be sending you out a five minute warning. And 3.55, you'll be pulled back into the main room and we will be having a larger discussion, report out and discussion on the uh, pedagogy conversation that we had. So that's the plan. Um, so if we are all ready, um, I think we could go straight to the Bearcat rooms. So, uh, well, thanks everyone. Um, I hope you all got to finish your sentences at least. I invariably always end up getting yanked out when I'm about to finish something. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so with that, um, I'd like to uh, ask each of the groups, uh, starting with group one or room one to uh, report out and then we can have the discussion that um, looking forward to having that. So I'll go ahead and, uh, oh, thanks, Cassandra. Uh, we're back to recording. Uh, so can I ask, um, I'd like to ask group one or the Zoom room one to get started. I think that's Ying Su, right? Yeah, I would like to ask if anyone in my room wants to give a uh, rundown or <laughs> what, what we mostly talked about was um, standard or conventional PCR. Um, Phil's, Phil's group needs um, some help with um, doing some PCR or, or teaching some PCR to um, the community college partners that he has. Um, and Phil, if I don't know if you want to give a little bit, is he still here? A little bit of background on, on where he's doing, what he's doing. He works with the NextGen Sequencing Core, 
in Northwestern, but he also partners with- Get to go. Oh, okay. The, the ABRF are planning their ATE. Oh, I see, okay. And so he, he just wanted to know a lot more about standard PCR. Um, Lori and Ingrid and I, I think bombarded him with a lot of different choices. <laughs> So hopefully he got something out of it. There's uh, nothing further from no. uh, room one. Two. Does anyone want to speak on behalf of us? Are you Zoom room two? Yes. Sure. <laughs> I, I guess I can try and sum it up. <laughs> so we, we talked a little bit about uh, how to teach uh, designing primers by hand on paper, uh, the mistakes that students make when learning in that way. And then uh, Bruce showed us primer three, the software and how to uh, use that. And we looked a little bit at what NCBI has to offer in terms of designing primers. And we also, so we talked about that, explored it a little bit further. And then eventually we talked about um, diluting the, the primers when you get them in the mail and having students approach that as a problem. Like here, here's the tube, here's the concentration you need in the final reaction. What are you gonna do and how that present students with a dilution problem and then ultimately realizing uh, I'm going to need a stock solution and <laughs> I can't just dilute it to the right concentration in the beginning. And uh, we talked about how maybe writing an SOP for that would be a good practice at writing an SOP. Um, and I think that's most of it. There are a few other things we talked about, but you know, those were less formal, <laughs> less a part of that. Daniel, I have a question for you. So how do they store those once they make the stock solution? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we talked about that too. I, I was saying that they should probably here to aliquot it so that they're not freezing and thawing it a lot. Um, yeah, but that's that's what they need to learn, that you need to, to make the stock, freeze it down, and then uh, use it as you need it. Is that what you're asking? Or were you yeah, getting... I know. Well, the, the one thing what I really liked about what you're doing is that people don't always realize teachable moments are start when someone gets a chemical or a solution or anything in the mail that comes to a lab. You know, don't make everything up for the students. Make them have to stock it, how to make the, how to store it. It's all these small little things that really make a difference. Right, absolutely. We, were, we talked quite a bit about uh, student frustration and how that can lead to those learning moments when they're trying to solve the problem. They don't even know where to start. And you give them some suggestions and get them kind of started and then they run into the next problem. And that, that, that stays with them uh, longer than just, okay, follow this protocol. Yeah, excellent. Did I get everything, Sean and Bruce? Yeah, I, sounds like it. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, and I did see the um, the Google slide has the links given. That's very useful. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I believe the next group is Linnea and uh, Michael. Well, I think I'll let Michael start because he actually did a lot of the session. And then maybe uh, Michael will want to call on people. I'll start with that. <laughs> if there's anyone who wanted to share out, um, Richard or Brianne um, or Jeremy, um, a little bit about our session. Sure. I'll. My camera's doing weird things. Um, what a day! <laughs> I'll tell you. Yeah, we were in lockdown too, so I can't even tell you the day I've had. Um, wow. I I would like to say that it was really helpful in the sense that Michael was relatable in regards to the kinds of classes that I'm experiencing this year and setting up lessons that will allow students to go piece by piece 
um, so that they understand not just the skill that they want to acquire, but then the usefulness of it. And then, you know, the application and, and what they're going to do with it. So I really liked that. And I, I loved the idea of carbonation because I think it, the, the students can really relate to these, these things in their lives, things like carbonated beverages and GMOs and food and the DNA, because that's going to be one of the things I'm going to work on as well. I just love the ideas that were presented that are very workable and tangible. So I can actually bring them back to my classroom and, and work with my high school kids. And I like the fact that we can, um, like Lene, you brought up that point of storage um, from the other group. I like that because I'm actually having my students help with the chemical storage um, in my prep rooms. So I, I like that. I think that was great. So I'm going to be quiet now because I'm like, Michael, I talk too much. Sorry, Michael, no insult. I want to say I want to thank Jeremy for the fact that he's I, I agree with Jeremy in that, and I always felt that no matter, in every one of our courses, I think we have like six lab courses, even though we go over pipetting extensively in the first course, I think the first week of every course should be a review of basic techniques that are gonna be really important in that course. And never assume that whatever they think they have mastered in the first course, that they had continue to master or they actually understand it. So thank you, Jeremy. So we're gonna make sure we go over our pipetting exercises in every course and then add more to it. Yeah, I just wanted to double back on something I think Daniel shared, which I think what's echoed in our group is, you know, what happens when students get stuck or they get frustrated um, and having students persevere Brian, he brought up from industry's perspective, being able to problem solve. And so, you know, we were talking about something as basic as micropipetting. I think understanding that, you know, there is a progression of your skills in micropipetting from just being able to do the mechanics of it to then being able to set the volume, then working in small volumes, and then working up to that levels, the levels that, um, uh, that Brian, he noted, you know, that you need an industry level. And so I think as much... <clears throat> You know, I'm living in the high school sphere more than I'm living in the community college sphere. So I think being really intentional with those um, those small spaces and those small progressions in your skill building can be helpful and help with the per perseverance side of it. And I just want to say, I really appreciate that too, because I know at least from my perspective, because I had been doing pipetting too long, that I have a tendency to just, oh, just put it all together. You know, so we lump mechanical with volume and we have them, I think this idea of maybe changing our labs to talk a little bit, have them do mechanical and then volume because industry in our area wants to, them to really understand the limits of their pipetter. So both limits high and low and middle. But I like the idea of what you're doing, Michael, is mechanical, volume, and then specialty pipe heading, like for PCR, which really, really small volumes, we have our students just put it on the inside of the tube so we can see that we actually delivered that volume. Or, you know, we make them follow the tip into the solution and how to show them how to carefully do the uh, mixing to make sure that we don't frappe proteins. So all these nuances make a big difference, but I totally agree it should be scaffold. Yeah, Bruce, Bruce was using a word I, I forgot to use. He said building confidence that a lot of this is about little step, getting frustrated, working it through, and then having the confidence that you can do that again in a different situation. I really appreciated that. I should tell you, Daniel, that actually one of the parameters that we use to measure our uh, success of our program is the confidence that a student has at the end of the program to carry out the techniques. It's really about what the student can do and they feel confident. 
how do you measure that learning outcome? <laughs> well, you know, it's kind of interesting. We have the faculty member do an evaluation and it's based on an evaluation that we got from industry. And then we have the student go through it themselves and they talk about their confidence level. So it's really like, you know, creating them, uh, changing them from a student to a colleague so that when they graduate, they're a colleague and not a student anymore. So essentially it's like, creating colleagues. And if we don't create that confidence in them by the time they graduate, then we haven't really done our job. So we make them articulate that. So it's like a pre-post survey. Yeah, exactly. In every course. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I like that. Oh, and someone asked me, what is the program? Oh, it's the program I run at Austin Community College in biotech. So, well, you know, I will just tell you how I discovered this and then I'll be quiet, is when our students went out for um, interviews and essentially industry would tell us with the results of the interview, we learned quickly about confidence levels and realized that we needed to know that they were confident before they went to the interview. And so then we started interviewing them in every class. What do you ask them in that interview? I like what you are saying. And I like that you said, we like to create colleagues, not students. And you are bringing um, new ideas to my class. And I see uh, less confidence in, in the students. Even when they get to be a senior, you know, at the senior level, like they are leaving, but they still need to follow just instructions. And I, I myself struggle to, to understand how to build more confidence in them and just to turn them from a student to be a colleague in the future in their jobs. Yeah, well... Uh, I have to admit that we do a lot of student focus groups and we do a lot of, we encourage student feedback um, on how the program is designed and how we evaluate the program, both faculty and the students. So the students have a lot of, have a lot to say or have a lot of they are allowed to say quite a bit. At first, they're very uncomfortable with it. So we, what is the program again? Is it like, are you talking oh, about a certificate program or is it a program to, uh, to, uh, to build communication leadership skills, other skills, you know? Um, it's to educate people to work in the workforce. So I run a biotech program at Austin Community College. It's a two-year program, so I have both two-year and four-year students, and then we also have a dual credit program in high schools. So I educate people to work in the workforce. So it's really important that their colleagues, by the time they graduate, they can't be students anymore. Ask Cassandra. She was one of our students. Yeah, I was going to say uh, yes. that, uh, Cassandra, we, we embed a lot of skills into the program like presentations and such. So Cassandra, please. Yes. So the evaluation that Linnea is talking about is self-evaluation. And it's kind of like what you would do in a company. You, you're given a form and you rate yourself on different aspects from like your lab skills to your reporting skills to your communication skills on a scale of one to five. Um, and then your professor does the same thing, same form, and then you have a meeting like you would with a manager and you go over the together. And on the scale of one to five, that adds up and creates your grade. So if you're not a confident student and you rate yourself really low, you just gave yourself a really bad grade that stands and it's kind of a learning lesson, right? If you're not confident in your skills, you need to better your skills and then like, don't underestimate what you can do. Because a lot of times professors will come back with a much higher grade than the student gives themselves. 
but their grade still stands at that point, right? And it's like a company, you wouldn't go in with your boss and say, oh, my pipe putting skills are like a three versus a five. And then, then you're like, how are you going to keep your job or get a raise or advance? So it's kind of like a real life learning technique there. But um, in every class we have presentations where you have to like come in your business attire, present in front of the group. We do a poster session for all of our internships. And then also we try to bring in industry so they kind of can ask more questions and see that they really do know what they need to know for industry. And this is, and you take also classes, right? Yes. So okay. like you okay. take, you take genetics, microbiology, and this is in every class? Uh, embedded in every class? So I did put a link down to the biotech um, is department. That, yeah, is that copying with me? I don't know. I'm trying to copy it. Um, let me try. There are copy. two links. They are not copied with me. I don't know why. So I, I'm curious too, what, what other professional skills do you incorporate into the so yeah, like, like working on like, a resume is yes. Oh yeah, a resume better. is part of every. It's part of every class, and it goes along with the self evaluation, where they have to submit a resume. They go over it with the instructor, and every semester, students are expected to update their resume with the skills that they have learned in that class. Uh, again, like in this semester, you are taking genetics and micro and plant. Do um, you do do the teachers or the instructors do the same procedure protocol in every course? So all of our biotechnology courses, so our intro to biotech one and two, our cell culture class, biomanufacturing, all have these embedded in the class. The general oh. courses through the college do not have those always embedded. Um, as they're really associated with different departments. So your chemistry one and two, your intro to biology, all of them don't have it. All of our biotechnology classes have it embedded. Okay, all right, all right. Is, the, so is, there a, is there an element in your program of mentorship? Do you have students teaching other students to help them develop confidence or, or learn how to do that? We do have our internship, kind of where they work closer with a professor on those things. And we're developing our alumni, which would kind of bring back more mentorship. We also have students who will work in the lab as part of their internship sometimes, and they usually work as good mentors um, to kind of talk with students about that. I want to ask a crazy question. Can I do that? <laughs> <laughs> of course, yes. <laughs> This is for Dr. Fletcher. So I like this idea so much. You don't know how much. So if I would say I would work to implement such a, a strategy, a protocol in my courses, would you help me like when I reach to you in advising? You know, oh, oh, yeah. And, and to be quite honest, you can see who I really trust to help you is Cassandra. I will definitely help you, but Cassandra I am is one of the, our graduates. I, she knows even more than we do at this point. She's the product of this. No, we will gladly help you. Because, because I am with the Leadership Institute, and I am personally thinking now to write a grant, and I am writing a grant. But this thought is just like, I really liked it because it really will help the students to build their confidence and uh, to let them uh, value their education, not just as a certificate, not, not just as a transcript, but they will see that they, they, they value themselves. They, they have the ownership for their education in, in the real, in the real term or words or whatever description. Yeah. I talk so much, I'm sorry. No, 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 that's... no I wanna add one more thing to that. Uh, Thank I, you, Cassandra. I, I one of the uh, 
one, one of the questions I heard was uh, about resumes. Uh, one of the things we actually insist on is that students don't write in their resumes. They just don't mention their skills. Now, for example, if you just take the PCR uh, work itself, if you just say skill PCR, that doesn't mean anything because everybody, it, everybody who takes PCR, if they just say PCR, it means nothing to a, a recruitment person, someone who is recruiting a student. Instead, if you elaborate that saying what you employed it for, maybe a troubleshooting aspect or something to do with the experiment done, where it implies that you know what PCR is used for, or you utilized it for a certain experiment or a project where you show your competency, that's much better put on a resume than just saying PCR. So we actually so, guide our students to be able to rewrite their resume so that it speaks to their ability and not just pulling out keywords from um, a job. So, so I help students a lot in, in doing, uh, as I think, an acceptable CV for grad school or uh, jobs. Because the way that they put it, you know, you have 20 years old, 21 years old, uh, you know, student. And then they put, I worked in Walmart and Kroger and so on first, because that is their, you know, employment experience. And then they put what they did in the lab. And I said, choose, you know, you want to go to the grad school. These are maybe now they are not really important. You can say shadowing, you say community service, whatever you want, but highlight. But now you added another element. I tell them, put your skills. But I did not think that they have to describe where they use the skill in, in a specific project. Even for myself, I don't, I don't think about it. So, you know, I did this in this fellowship and so on. But uh, that's, a, that's a good uh, idea that to help the students know that it is really important that they master the technique. I tell them you have to master the technique, not just to say I do HBLC, right? Because yes. I know the theory, but <laughs> send me to do HBLC, I don't know. And, uh, you know, it's a good thought. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And then with that, we go to or last but not the least, <laughs> the, la the room number four. We have uh, uh, Betsy and Lee. Thank you. And yeah, we, we, I don't know if somebody, let's see, was somebody, there's a few people in here that were in our room. I didn't know if one of them wanted to speak to what we spoke about. <laughs> I can speak. I had a student, you know, in and out, so I was not so focused. With, mm -hmm. I had some of it, but I heard something about the the DD PCR, and and you put you talked about the cyber green, but maybe somebody else can be a better <laughs> presenter today. <laughs> And honestly, I did not know about the DDPCR until yesterday. So I don't know what you guys will say about me, but it's just <laughs> like, I don't know. Uh, you let me know that, or, you know, I have to catch up with the technology. I did not do this stuff for a while. You aren't alone. <laughs> no. no. Yeah, I said like yesterday, I read like, what is that DD? Uh, I thought that I saw something typo. And I said like, is it? And it is. So we spent a lot of time also talking about the importance of pipetting skills and um, how detrimental not having good skills can be on any kind of qPCR analysis that you're going to do. Um, we also talked a little bit about the different types of detection chemistries that are available. We talked about why you might choose one chemistry over another um, and some of the advantages or disadvantages of each of those chemistries. And I mostly focused on cyber green and hydrolysis probe analysis, um, kind of 
footnoting that there's lots of other ones out there, but that most, most labs are using one of those two. Um, and then we also talked a little bit about how you could spend a whole career optimizing a PCR, not that you'd want to, um, but that you can either, you know, get it to a certain point that's good enough, or you should just scrap it and start over with new primer design. Um, and so we, you know, kind of talked a little bit about all of that. We talked a little bit about contamination and primer dimer. Um, and then we kind of segued in the last few minutes, the digital droplet systems um, and the, the BioRad system that we have in particular and how that can also be kind of coupled with qPCR teaching. Um, I know the class that I teach, I, I've actually implemented not only qPCR on a number of different systems, but we do actively use the Droplet Digital System in that class as well, um, just to kind of give them another way of, of looking at data, another type of analysis. I mentioned I'd love to see Betsy doing another talk. Um, <laughs> where we talk about kind of um, independent research or how students might in a classroom like hers or in a lab like hers, um, when they're optimizing primers, are they doing their own primer sets? Or are they doing kind of everyone as a group or just the, the nitty gritty of how to teach um, real-time PCR? I, I would find interesting just because I work with, you know, teachers um, to know kind of, you know, I, I know our, we have our kits and stuff and that's, I was about to put our, um, our COVID detection kit in the chat here. I'll add a link to that. Um, and I'll also add a link to one of our other um, um, PowerPoints that we have about real time. Um, yeah. But Betsy's PowerPoint that we pres that she presented was really, really useful, I thought, for me. Um, but I would love to hear from her and from whoever else is teaching this in our classrooms just about... Um, you know, what does that look like? Is it, mm -hmm. it are, are they all doing the same thing or are they all um, kind of going on their own ways and optimization, you know, is happening? Are they designing their own primers? How does that look? So anyway. So, yeah, so for, for the class that I teach, which is like that full semester, just qPCR is all it is. Um, so <laughs> the, I think it, it's important to think about what it is you want the students to get out of out of the class. And so um, we do spend a couple nights on primer design. Um, we spend a lot of time talking about troubleshooting and we have a project that's the last half of the semester that they do. Um, but I think in terms of, you know, logistically, in terms of getting the primers here and um, having everything in place that they need to do a project. While we do some primer design and we talk about it, um, the primers they design are not the ones that they're going to use for the project because I've already gone, I've designed those myself. I have materials in place. In this case, we have C. elegans that we have harvested with different mutations that we're looking for different gene expressions. And we're, we've, I've already selected the reference genes. We multiplex um, with the gene of interest. And so there's a lot that goes into optimizing that. And the whole class could really just be optimization. And I'm not sure that that would get as much out of it for them as actually going through the process of learning about optimization and primer design and the different types of analysis that you might do if you're gonna use a genomic template versus an RNA template. Um, and so I, I think it's more valuable for the students to actually, okay, this is a mutant worm, we're looking at these two genes. We want to know if they're upregulated or downregulated in this mutant worm versus a control. And so it makes them use a lot more of that understanding to, you know, process that information to actually set up the reactions, evaluate their data after they've run it, do some data analysis, and make conclusions based on that data analysis. Did it upregulate? Did it downregulate it? Was it exactly the same as the wild type? And they have to write that up and they have to do a presentation. And so um, they not only have to do it and understand it, but then they have to tell everyone else too. <laughs> so I don't know if that answers your question, Lee. <laughs> yeah, it does. That's great. Yeah. I'd be interested in to know um, 
how many of you think they'd like a face-to-face -face workshop on PCR techniques, different types of PCR techniques? Oh, that'd be fun. Can we all go to St. Louis? Yes, everyone should come here. We'll have so much fun. She just volunteered. <laughs> I yeah, did, I start. did, I'm sorry, I did. <laughs> okay. No, okay, well then that's good. <laughs> No, we'll, we're, we'll do it. We'll, Jen, and the center will help pay for it. Yeah, sounds great Jen, for it, period. Can, can, uh, I cannot copy any of the links. For some reason, it allows me only to copy the numbers. Is there a way that we save the chat? I cannot save it today. Did you try posting them and try this? I'm just gonna try posting it without text. Does that work? Sometimes if it's like text plus a link, it's weird. No, I took only the links and just the link, you know, like that. And it's not allowing me. It says select all and then it will select all, which is weird for me. Hmm. Yeah, usually I can. But um, I don't know I can why. The I, links. I can give our links to Cassandra and when she sends out an email, um, they'll, they can go in there if that works. That is appreciated. Thank yeah, you. No problem. The other um, um, webinar or workshop people suggested was Daniel suggested one on all the different ways we educate students in soft skills. I think that would be a good one for all the programs to share how they do that, because I don't know how people feel about it, but I'm going to probably figure out how to do it in the spring and invite everybody to share their um, approaches for educating students in soft skills. I have to admit, it probably was one of the hardest things for our program to figure out. And probably, and it is the I most important one because of how they have to go to a company and they have to be employees. Yeah, yeah. You know, our, like, our, advisory yeah. Board, our advisory boards have consistently said, we'll ask, okay, what skills should they know? Pipetting, this. And they always say soft skills. That's the mm -hmm. first answer that they say like we want yeah. them to be professional when they, they start yeah. so, so i would really be curious to hear all the different approaches people have taken yeah i would be really interested in that as well Linnea. and we we do some things a little bit differently than what you do we do focus a lot on those soft skills and presentations and all that and resumes um our end of the program final thing is a technical skills assessment where we actually have the students um, pick something out of you know one of the core classes biotech one or two that they've done and they have to put together a presentation we make them practice the presentation and give them feedback um, and then they have to present that to a panel of three um, industry partners oh and my they, gosh yeah and it's very intimidating actually um but i will say once they come out on the other side of that they feel great about you know what they know and and how to hold themselves in a professional way that would be a confidence builder yeah very much a confidence builder so it still addresses the confidence issue it just does it in a little bit different way maybe a little more intimidating way <laughs> i don't know if that's good or bad <laughs> How long that presentation is? Their presentation is supposed to be 20 minutes and then they are, they, we leave 10 minutes after that um, for questions from the industry panel. And our industry panels are usually pretty, uh, they do ask them some questions. That's wow. like a defense of your doctorate. It <laughs> is, yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. When like we, in, in, in my institution, I uh, could not do it with the teamwork. So myself, I chartered an organization and it's, it's, it's a member of an international organization, the Toastmasters organization, Toastmasters International, if you heard about that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the students follow the program from the international, but basically they present, they do presentations they come to the meeting, they, uh, and I subsidize actually from my pocket their, their membership. And we, uh, we held a weekly meeting and every time they finish a program, they get an official certificate from Toastmasters International. So, but it's still, I 
I cannot think in a, in a better way to engage that organization, which they call it Abu Niyaz organization, in, in uh, letting the students get the more benefit from it. You know, like it just is there, it's on campus, it is registered on campus, but still the students are not getting the full benefit to learn more soft skills. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, it's just like, you let I me have, guys think about so many things today. I well, have I just thought, said I, it up. I'm kind of curious. So how many of you have let your students like an advanced course, essentially come up with grading rubrics. Because oh, I, I tried that and then they went and complained to me and they said that's confidentiality. And they did a big trouble for me because they did not like it. I'm telling you. Yeah. Well, I'm kind of curious because I actually get my students, they already know how labs are supposed to be written by the second year courses, so I make them come up with grading rubrics. Good idea. And, you know, that really blows them away. Of course, they try to cheat, you know, oh, five points for results. I said, let's yeah. be realistic. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I feel, I feel okay now. <laughs> <laughs> Have you tried peer evaluation where they grade each other's notebooks? I, I find oh, that yes. really, that's oh, really yeah. interesting because the they see examples from other students and yeah. start to realize like, oh, I'm not performing or maybe I'm a little too much of a perfectionist. They yeah. Oh, I think that's a great idea, Daniel. I do that too. Yeah. Yeah. They, I do they're, that tougher. Too. they're tougher graders than faculty. <laughs> I do I do that, but they uh, if they grade for a friend. Then they are lax, and again, also sometimes they go and complain. Yeah. I I like to take a write up from like a previous semester, and and have them review it for me, so I can kind uh, of get a, a feel for how they are thinking about this particular experiment or um, what they're looking at versus what I usually look at. So, oh, that's a good one. Yeah. No, no, one thing we do in our program is since we we do have open lab and we insist on mastery. And so if they can't master a skill, we expect them to do open lab mm -hmm. and master it. Because we tell them you can't go on. We're we're not teaching you anything that's wasted. We only are teaching you what industry wants. Right. So it's not like maybe they've had in other courses where everything was just blown over, you know, in terms of a lab. Well, it didn't work. Okay, well, well whatever. You can't go back. No, we, we go back. I think that's really important. Don't you think, guys? So they value their education is like, yeah. this isn't a game anymore. No. And I, I yeah. guess we've gone over, but I really feel like the idea, this is not a game. Uh, yeah, that's that's true. It's just, you know, and, and but also, you know, a different faculty, one of, of the things that I find challenging is how different faculty deliver the education or the material or think about the students mastery for skills you know today you mentioned I don't know who mentioned that I think you is not good to to make it easy for students you mentioned that it's a, a learning moment that when they do everything even when they store something and sometimes you know I see some faculty or some colleagues, they say, oh, it's just I prepare everything for them so they are not struggling. And usually I think, oh, no, just let them do it. And I did it a couple of times. Yeah, it's easy, even if it's easy for me, but I don't think that it is uh, fruitful for them, for their learning. Uh, I did not like it. You know, I tried it a few times, a couple of times, but I did not really like it because I think that they will become as a robot. They mm -hmm. put the things on this and this, and oh, okay, everything is dandy and good. 
Yeah. Struggle is important. Yeah. Yeah. Struggle is important. Well, guys, Pornima, have we gone over? Oh, yeah. We have. Uh, <laughs> but this was a... Uh, this was an amazing conversation. I, I realized that we can keep going. There's so much more to talk and so much more to learn. Uh, but please use this opportunity to fill out our survey and let us know what more you want and how we can uh, get other uh, topics covered and also about the face-to-face -face and the techniques that we could uh, go ahead and support everyone. We'd really love to get your um, input on that and help us help you better. Yeah, and, uh, and remember, you you're you're not alone in this. Mm -mm. I guarantee it. <laughs> that you know, I feel better all, every time I come with a group and they say the same. I feel oh, okay. <laughs> I still yeah. can make it. <laughs> but thank you so much. I just learned about uh, this meeting two days ago, but I'm so glad that I could make it. Thank you, and thank, thank you, you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you.